The story of Apple. An obsessive focus on the user experience helped Apple become one of the world's most successful companies. Did you know that Apple passed the two trillion market cap mark? Which is all the more impressive given that Apple almost didn't make it this far. Previously, Apple had been struggling to find its feet in a market increasingly dominated by Microsoft and its partners when Steve Jobs took over as CEO in 1997. But now it's one of the top companies in the world. Do you want to know more? Make sure you hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up. On April 1st, 1976, college dropouts Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak founded Apple Computers Incorporated, intending to change people's perception of computers. Jobs and Wozniak wanted to make computers small enough to fit into people's homes or offices. Simply put, they desired an easy to use computer Steve Jobs and Wozniak began by handcrafting the Apple I in Jobs' garage and selling it without a monitor, keyboard, or casing, which they decided to add in 1977. The introduction of the first color graphics on the Apple II revolutionized the computer industry. Sales increased from 7.8 million in 1978 to 117 million the following year when Apple went public. The Apple II was introduced in 1977, also by Wozniak. VisiCalc, the world's first killer app, was a groundbreaking spreadsheet and calculating software that enabled Apple II computers to outperform market leaders Tandy and Commodore Pet. Because of its Office compatibility, VisiCalc gave users another reason to buy the Apple II. The Apple II revolutionized the computer industry by introducing color graphics. Apple had a real office with several employees by 1978 and an Apple II production line. In the years since, Apple's revenues have grown exponentially, doubling every four months. Between September 1977 and September 1980, their annual sales increased by 533%, from $775,000 to $118 million. In 1979, Steve Jobs and several employees were granted access to the Xerox Park Lab. It is well known worldwide for its laser printer, mouse, Ethernet networking, and other technological achievements. Jobs and his engineers paid a visit to the Park campus in exchange for the option to purchase 100,000 shares of Apple stock at $10 per share. With IBM and Microsoft in the market by 1980, the competition was becoming increasingly difficult. The same year, Apple released the Apple III to compete with these companies in the corporate computing market. Due to a design flaw, the Apple III could have been more successful. Jobs insisted on computers not having fans or vents to reduce noise, which caused problems due to dangerous overheating. As a result, the Apple III was defeated by IBM computers. Unfortunately, due to infighting, Jobs was forced to leave the Lisa team and join the low-cost computer project, the Macintosh. Lisa was released in 1983 and sold poorly due to its high price and limited software support. On December 12, 1980, Apple went public at $22 per share. According to the EDN network, Apple's 4.9 million shares sold out instantly, raising more capital than any other IPO, initial public offering, since the Ford Motor Company in 1957. Steve Jobs, the largest shareholder, gained $217 million due to the IPO. The company's IPO also instantly made 300 other people millionaires. Steve Jobs took over as leader of the Macintosh team after being replaced by the Lisa team. The Apple Macintosh is widely regarded as the most user-friendly computer ever created. It is also considered the first mass-market personal computer to include an integrated graphical user interface (GUI) and mouse. The Macintosh, unlike Lisa, was a success due to aggressive marketing, including the iconic 1984 commercial directed by Ridley Scott, which aired during the Super Bowl and will never be repeated. Even though the graphics hardware used was costly, Apple decided to sell the Macintosh at a price that was affordable to home users. Its black and white graphics and visual abilities drew design professionals, which was widely successful in the desktop publishing market. It had a carrying handle, making it portable, and it also appeared friendly. The Macintosh cost $2,495 and was released in January 1984. Although not cheap, it was good value for money. 
As a result of the 1984 commercial, 70,000 units were shipped by the beginning of May 1984. When Mike Markala, Apple's second CEO, decided to retire in 1983, around the time of the launch of the Macintosh, Jobs hired John Scully as the new CEO. Scully was Pepsi's youngest CEO then, but Jobs lured him to Apple with the famous question, do you want to sell sugared water for the rest of your life? Or do you want to join me in changing the world? When Macintosh failed to break IBM's dominance, tensions between Jobs and Scully grew. Furthermore, Jobs preferred to do things his way, whereas Scully preferred strict oversight over future products. As both Lisa and the Macintosh could not compete with IBM and others at the time. As tensions between Jobs and Scully grew, Jobs attempted to depose Scully through a coup, which backfired. Apple's board of directors sided with Scully and relieved Jobs of his managerial duties. Jobs then left his job and found Next, a company that manufactures advanced workstations. Steve Wozniak also went around the same time, selling the majority of his shares and claiming that the company was headed in the wrong direction. With Jobs gone, the board was free to consider what kind of machine Apple would produce. They decided to sell more expensive Macs in high-end markets. Because Steve Jobs was opposed to raising prices, they could only implement this policy after he left. They agreed that even if fewer units are sold, profits will still be comparable or higher. This policy was known as 55 or die. It was Jean-Louis Gasset's rule that the Macintosh 2 must generate at least 55% profit per machine. Gasset was the man hired by Scully in place of Steve Jobs. Even though Apple computers were quite expensive in comparison to other computers on the market, they had advantages such as the user interface that kept their customers loyal. In 1991, Apple released the PowerBook laptop and the System 7 operating system. System 7 was responsible for bringing color to the Macintosh OS and was used until 2001, when OS X was released. Apple attempted to enter new markets in the 1990s. Gasset was also involved in developing new products, such as the Newton Message Pad and the E-Mate, hoping that these would propel the company to new heights. However, with prices as high as $700 and functions limited to taking notes and managing contacts, these new products still need to find a market. The Newton Message Pad was Apple's flop of the 1990s. Gasset's tenure ended in 1990 as well. Apple then introduced the Macintosh Classic, Macintosh LC, and the Macintosh 2 SI, which were lower-cost models that also sold well. Apple's 55 or die policy backfired in the decade's final years as IBM clones became more affordable and Microsoft's influence grew. Despite having an excellent software library, Macs were limited. Windows 3.0, on the other hand, was available for low-cost commodity computers. Apple needed to re-establish itself in the market, so it introduced a new line of computers, the Quadra, Centris, and Performa. Because Apple computers were only available through mail or authorized dealers then, the Performa was designed to be a stock item for department stores and other lifestyle outlets. Back then, there was no Apple Store. These computer lines were rebranded versions of their existing stock with new consumer-friendly software like Claris Works and Grolier Encyclopedia added to attract home users. On the other hand, customers were perplexed because they needed to understand the distinction between these models. Apple also experimented with products such as digital cameras, portable CD audio players, speakers, TV appliances, and so on but they were all a failure. Apple's market capitalization and stock price have continued to fall. To compound his errors, Scully spent significant time and money porting System 7 to the new IBM Motorola PowerPC microprocessor rather than the Intel processor. Because most software was written for Intel processors, which were cheaper, Apple had yet to gain market share. The Apple board had had enough of the highly unsuccessful product line and the costly decision to switch to PowerPC. Scully was fired in 1993 and replaced as CEO by Michael Spindler, a German expatriate who had been with Apple since the 1980s. Spindler, unfortunately, had to repeat Scully's PowerPC error. The first PowerPC-based Macintosh was released in 1994, but Apple's problems persisted. 
One reason was the market popularity of Windows at the time. Gil Emilio took over as CEO in 1996, succeeding Spindler. Emilio implemented several changes, including extensive layoffs and cost-cutting measures. Apple's stock also marred his tenure and hit a 12-year low. Emilio bought Jobs' next computer for $429 million in February 1997, bringing Steve Jobs back to Apple. In July 1997, Jobs persuaded the board to appoint him as interim CEO. The board agreed with Jobs due to massive financial losses and three-year low stock price. A week later, Emilio resigned. Jobs announced at the 1997 Macworld Expo that Apple would collaborate with Microsoft to create new versions of Microsoft for the Macintosh. He also revealed that Microsoft had made a $150 million investment in non-voting Apple stock. Apple launched the online Apple Store on November 10, 1997. Jobs was impressed by Jonathan Ives' design talent, and the two collaborated to rebuild Apple's reputation. On August 15, 1998, Apple introduced the iMac, an all-in-one computer. Jonathan Ive led the iMac design team and went on to create the iPod and iPhone. Because of its cutting-edge technological features and distinctive design, the iMac sold 80,000 units in just five months. Jobs preferred to focus on a narrow range of products rather than a broad spectrum. He limited the computer line to four models, two for business and two for consumers. He also dissolved many other divisions, including the Newton message pad. Apple purchased Macromedia's key group software project in 1998, expanding its video editing market. When it was released in April 1999, it was called Final Cut Pro. Even at the time of its sale, it was unfinished. The development of key grip software resulted in the October 1999 release of Apple's video editing software iMovie. In 2001, Mac OS X replaced System 7, based on the operating system from Next Computers. The iPod Portable Digital Audio Player was released the same year, selling 100 million units in six years. Apple introduced the App Store in July 2008 to sell third-party applications for the iPhone and iPod Touch. Within a month, the App Store sold 60 million applications and generated an average daily revenue of 1 million. Because of the iPhone's popularity, Apple has risen to become the world's third largest supplier of mobile handsets. In October 2010, Apple stock reached an all-time high of $300. Steve Jobs resigned as CEO on August 24, 2011, citing health concerns, and was succeeded by Tim Cook. On October 5, 2011, Jobs died ending a momentous era for Apple and a significant shift in the company's history. However, Apple continues to have an impact and dominate the market. If your company is doing something out of the ordinary, friends, family, and business acquaintances may question the wisdom of doing so. However, Steve Jobs' example demonstrates that trusting your instincts and following your vision can lead to enormous success. If one of your company's innovations does not go as planned, it can be disheartening. However, after the initial disappointment, try to learn from it and rebound as Steve Jobs did for Apple. The small details are what set Apple's products apart. A few iPhone features outperform other products on the market, but no single product outperforms the iPhone. Apple customers rarely question the company's design expertise. Wouldn't it be great if your clients thought highly of you? Where do iPod, iPhone, and iPad users get their apps, music, and movies? Apple's after-sales business is believed to be more profitable than its branded product line. Why invest in your R&D when you can claim a 30% cut of another company's revenue? That said, you just explored the success story of Apple. From uniqueness to losses and then rising again, Apple has significantly impacted the business world. So what do you think about this video? Comment below and share this with everyone to prosper. Keep an eye out for more of this type of content.